I'm going to continue on in the worship of our God, the preaching of His Word. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And I want us to read together from verse 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Please rise as we honor the reading of God's word. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have given us a great commission, and that is to make disciples of all the nations, to teach them what you have taught us, to teach them the scriptures, to teach them the gospel, Lord, that those who hear it might come to faith, and those who have come to faith, who hear it again, may be conformed more into the image of the Son of God. Lord, I pray that as we um, finish up this mini-series on finances, that we would be mindful of the great call to which you have called us. Um, Help us to be faithful in laboring. Help us, help us to be faithful in giving. Lord, that through every aspect of our lives, we might be worshiping you and furthering the cause of the gospel and seeking first, above all, the kingdom of God. Lord, bless us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so last week we talked about the subject of greed and how we can take practical steps to fight against greed, and that is be generous and joyful in our giving, believing that the kingdom of God is worthy, that the things of God is worthy. And by putting our treasures in the things of God, our hearts are driven deeper into the depths of heaven's glory so that our faith in the worthiness of the kingdom continues to grow, thereby increasing our generosity and joy. And it's this the cycle that spirals upward. So this is how you fight against greed. This is how you fight against self-centered uh, and selfishness. Now I tried to show how a good starting point is 10%, and I gave two reasons for that. 10% is what the Old Testament saints gave, so that we who live in the era of grace in the New Testament can give more than 10%, and we can give in a manner that is flexible. The second reason that I gave is because Paul uses Old Testament tithing to argue for the sensibility of providing for the pastors who care for the church, just as the priests were provided for in order to care and minister before the temple. Now today, what I want to do is I want to talk about how our giving should reflect the priority of the local church, and the priority of the local church. And then after that, I want to talk about the vision for our church and how we allocate the funds to fulfill that vision. Okay, so i got two points today. First is going to be, the priority of local church giving, and second, the vision for our church. Again, last week I talked about how we need to be generous in our giving, to even consider giving 10% as a starting point after having taken care of our families. And um, the question to ask then is how much should we give to the local church? How much should we give to uh, missions? How much should we give to a seminary or, or to a parachurch ministry? Because all of these institutions are progressing the gospel and the kingdom forward in their different ways. Now, there's no strict answers, uh, answer to that, but uh, I believe we have enough data points in the Bible to show that the priority of our giving should be to the local church. As we talked about in the first message, before we give to our Lord or before we give to the church, we must make sure that our family is taken care of. Uh, if you're single, you take care of yourself. And if you're in a place to take care of your family, you wanna, uh, your parents, you want to be doing that. If you're married uh, to the husbands, you must be able to take care of your family, including your wives and your children, and uh, again, our parents, to have their needs met, uh, needs met, not wants that are perceived as needs, but actual needs. And then after those needs are met, we, uh, met, we are to give to the Lord and to his people, and then after giving to the Lord and his people, we are to minister to the world. So there are three parts. There's the family, there's the church, and then there's the world. Uh, these are the concentric circles of priority for us as believers. Now, again, giving to the church, I believe the local church should take priority when we consider the universal church at large. And the reason for this is because our immediate responsibility is to each other. 
Our immediate responsibility is to each other. A local church cannot minister faithfully outside of itself unless it is first faithful from within. Because how can a Christian say that he cares for a person, for another whom he hardly knows when his brother or sisters are suffering right there in front of him or has needs that are yet to be met? And so when Paul addresses the many churches in his epistles, he is primarily calling the church to take care of itself. He's asking for help, how do they minister to others outside of the church, but primarily he's telling them to take care of themselves. Uh, For example, to guard against spiritual attacks in the local church. We see that in the book of Colossians. To dress moral shortcomings and failures in the local church, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Or to care for the widows in the local church, 1 Timothy chapter 5. The first responsibility for churches is to care for the members of the church, which then affects the priority of our giving. And I want to give three specific reasons why we prioritize local church giving. Okay, three specific reasons why we prioritize local church giving. The first is to meet the needs of the church. To meet the needs of the church. Second, to seize opportunities for greater ministry. And third, to engage the congregation and to cultivate financial accountability. Okay, so three reasons. To meet the needs of the church. To seize opportunities for greater ministry. And third, to engage the congregation to cultivate financial accountability. Let's talk about the the first reason why why we need to prioritize the local church, and that is to meet the needs of the church. The most obvious purpose of prioritizing our giving to the church is to make sure that the church has everything that it needs, including the financial care for the pastor and the payment for the operating expenses of the church. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, it says, Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, it says, Let the elder who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. The Bible clearly says that the elder who labors in the church in teaching and preaching must be cared for. His needs must be supplied so that he can faithfully administer and feed the congregation the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 2, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The responsibility of the preacher is to teach the word of God. Why? Why? Because the proclamation of God's word, the hearing of God's word, conforms you more into the image of the Son of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. In order for you to grow as a Christian, you must faithfully hear the word of God. But for you to hear the word of God, the word of God must be taught. But the word of God to be taught faithfully, the preacher and the herald must study the word of God faithfully. And so to free the pastor up, the minister up, to study the word of God and to administer the word of God through preaching and through counseling, his needs must be supplied. So that is one of the first responsibilities of the church. Now, in addition to providing the needs for the pastor, we must also ensure that we meet all the operating expenses for the church, including the facility for worship and the purchases needed to facilitate fellowship and communion. Romans chapter 16, verse 5 says, Greet also the church in their house. Greet also the church in their house. So there was a physical place of worship. Obviously, none of us can fit in anybody's house here. Therefore, we use a facility here. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46 to 47, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The practice of fellowship and communion was established in the first century church, a practice that would have required funds. Right? They received the food to themselves. They broke bread within the home, meaning that these things had to be purchased. And of course, the offerings that the church collects allows them to supply the needs of those who are truly widows. 1 Timothy 5, verse 16, it says, If anyone, any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. The responsibility of the church is to care for those who cannot care for themselves, especially as those who are uh, truly widows. And these are for people who have already shown their faithfulness in loving and serving the ministry. 
So the obvious reason to prioritize local church giving is to meet the needs of the church. Okay? So it's pretty obvious uh, to all of us. Now, what if the church clearly has met their needs? The pastor is well supplied. Operating expenses are covered. And there's a healthy amount of funds that are kept in savings for emergencies. And that brings me to the second reason why we should prioritize giving to the local church. That is to seize the opportunity for greater ministry. To seize the opportunity for greater ministry. We must not only consider how our funds are to be used to maintain the operations of the church in the present, but we also have to think about the opportunities for the growth of the church, both locally and universally, in the future. We have to think about those opportunities. When it comes down to local church growth, the greatest help that the church is going to need are ministers. We're going to need ministers, elders, pastors. This was the case with Barnabas and Paul in the church of Antioch. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 26. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 26. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, chapter 11, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Because of the growth at the church in Antioch, the saints in Jerusalem decided to send Barnabas to minister to them, to care for them, to disciple them. But as Barnabas continued to minister, the church began to grow even more so that he went to Tarsus to seek out Saul to come and to bring him along to help out with the work of the ministry. A fundamental need for the growth of the church is going to be shepherds to care for the growing needs of that church. And so that is something for which we must be prepared. But not only must believers prepare for growth within the local church, but they must be faithful to grow the universal church outside of the local, local ministry, which requires considerable resources, resources that are to be supplied by the local church. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. We've read this a number of times, but I want to read it again. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18. And you, Philippians, yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So here we see Paul is going out doing, doing the work of a missionary, doing the work of a church planter, and he tells the Philippians and he blesses them because he has received the supplies that were given to him from them. He says, I am well supplied. And so comes to show that we must, the church must be prepared, prepared to supply the needs of those who will go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must be prepared for that. So though a church may seem well supplied to maintain the status quo, it may not necessarily have the funds that is helpful or needed for growth. Wisdom dictates that we not only have enough for the present, but we have enough to prepare and to plan and strategize for the future. Okay? So we give in order that we might have the funds to seize opportunities that are presented to us. 
Now by, the fund, now, by funding the needs of the local church and financially preparing for opportunities for growth, the lo- members of the church will be compelled, right? you will be compelled and you will be called upon to faithfully utilize the funds for the work of the gospel ministry, which naturally creates a community of accountability, even financial accountability. And this brings me to the third reason why we must prioritize local church giving, and that is congregational engagement and financial accountability. Congregational engagement and financial accountability. Naturally, by collecting a church offering, the people of God are held responsible to distribute and manage those funds to personally help and minister to the members of the church. In other words, you have to get involved. All of you have to get involved. Acts chapter 4, verse 34 to 35 says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. With the offering given to the apostles, there is specifically a need here for service, including the work of accountability, uh, accounting and distribution. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, we find something similar. It says, Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Again, with the purchasing of food or supplies, there's a need for service. There's a need for distribution. Finances increases the ability to help. And with the ability to help, there's a greater moral obligation to help, an obligation that the church must fulfill. So the congregation must step up. But with the church engagement, there is direct accountability. The funds, there is accountability for the funds to be utilized effectively and wisely. Remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 35, it says, And it was distributed to each as any had need. There must be wise evaluation of what truly constitutes needs here. And the corresponding amount or kind of aid must be determined in order to meet that need. And so there's going to be accountability as money is being handled for the work of the kingdom. And of course, members are to ensure that the leaders who are supported in fulfilling their duties and pastoral responsibilities and living a life that is above reproach, they are to make sure that the pastors and the leaders are held accountable. If a pastor disqualifies himself, he is to be removed from the office and effectively cut off from the payroll. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19 to 20 says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. For those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. So wisdom, listen carefully, wisdom naturally dictates that we support institutions that are trustworthy, believing that our contributions will not be squandered but used efficiently for its intended purpose. The more we believe in a cause and the more we trust in the groups that minister for that cause, the more we are willing to come behind them in our service and our finances. In other words, the more we trust a ministry, the more we're willing to support them. Right? That makes sense. When we support a missionary overseas or a parachurch ministry, sometimes all we can go off of is a monthly newsletter or maybe an annual report so that we might be more or less reserved in our giving. I remember when I was out in the mission field in Taiwan, um, I was busy doing about the Lord's work, but I remember a a missionary there, and I always kind of wondered what she was doing um, because it didn't seem like she was doing all that much. It uh, didn't seem like she was being all that effective or working as uh, efficiently as she could. And so I wondered why she was there, because she could have probably been better used by the Lord by maybe supporting missions financially instead of being on the field in that way. Um, and there are a lot of people out on the field. I don't know if you guys realize, but there are a lot of, I don't want to say a lot, but there's enough people out on the field who may not be doing much and are simply hiding behind a newsletter where they keep up the appearances of being busy. There are people like that out there, and I've come across people like that. And so we have to be more discerning in supporting these kind of groups. Now, if the missionary or the parachurch worker is a friend that we trust, then we are more inclined to give. Yes, that makes sense? Again, that makes sense. Now, in the local church, you see everything. Right? You see everything, how every dollar is being spent, how effectively the funds are being stewarded. Right? You guys know how much I make. <laughs> you know these things. You're able to ask questions. Offer suggestions. You're even able to make the work of the ministry more efficient so that the dollar that you contribute goes even further. 
You're engaged and you're involved in the accountability, which should create a greater confidence in your giving. And if for some reason you cannot trust the church and its leaders with your finances, then you need to ask whether you need to ask yourself whether you can entrust your souls to these men, whether you can trust the soul to the church and to the leadership. But if you trust the church with your soul, then entrust them with the handling of the finances to fulfill the cause behind which you stand. Now, what is the cause? What is the cause? What is the vision for the church? This brings me to the second point. The vision of Crossside Bible Church. I remember one time I was in the hallway at our old building, and somebody came and asked me, he said, you know, Pastor Jane, what's the vision for Crossside? And it kind of took me aback. I never really thought about it. You know, in my mind, I was just simply, you know, just get the gospel out and save people so that they don't go to hell, <laughs> you know, for the glory of God. That was uh, very simple-minded. And so he asked me that, and I thought about it, and I just looked at it, and I said, it is the Great Commission. It is the Great Commission. And as I thought about it more after I said that, I go, it is, it is the Great Commission, you know, because it's always been the Great Commission. It's always been the creation, the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the vision of our church, if not all the churches out there. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The mission of the church is to go out to the world to tell people about what Jesus Christ has done. How he has come into this world and died for the forgiveness of their sins and resurrected from the dead so that they might have eternal life. This is the message that we proclaim. That there's nothing that they do, no work that they can fulfill in order to attain, the, 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 attain heaven, to merit heaven. All they have to do is believe in what Jesus Christ has done. This is our mission as a church. This is our vision. This is the meaning and the purpose of our life. Now, discipleship consists of two things. It consists of evangelism and training. Evangelism and training. That's what it means to disciple. Now, this is our main purpose. If our main purpose is to go out into the world and tell people what Jesus Christ has done upon Calvary's tree and how he resurrected from the dead, if that's our mission, then our finances should reflect that mission. Our finances should reflect that vision. We as a church must be prioritized must be prioritizing evangelism and training, that the people of God might grow both in breadth through conversion and in depth through personal growth. So much of the way that we as a church utilize its funds corresponds with the very reason why the members of the congregation should prioritize local church giving. You see, the church must faithfully pay the staff so that they are free to shepherd God's people. Paul says this to the Corinthian church. Not to just any individual. He tells the church at large, in the same way, chapter 9, verse 14, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. He's telling the church, those who preach the gospel must earn their living by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, and he says, And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. The reason why the pastor must be supplied is so that he can equip the saints for the work of the ministry. For the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ, so that we might attain unity in faith. That's why the pastor must be supplied. Then we see that when it comes down to giving and supplying the needs of the missionary, it's not, the only, it's not only the individual Christians who are called, called upon to give, but the church as a whole is called to faithfully contribute to the needs of the saints. Paul says to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 5 through 6, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia if I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. He's telling the Corinthian church, I'm going to drop by and spend some time with you and have my needs supplied by you. And he says to the church of Rome, Romans chapter 15, verse 24, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I've enjoyed your company for a while. He expects the church to supply his needs so that he can continue the work of the gospel ministry, his missionary work, his church planting efforts. And of course, you as a part of the church must be involved in the efforts of local church ministry for both the work within our community and for the support of missionaries and ministry outside and to ensure that the work is done faithfully and the finances are handled faithfully. 
So that's our vision. Right? That's what we're going to do as a church. Now, so I was uh, preparing this message. I was thinking about where to go from here. Um, I thought it might be good for me to share um, specifically how I feel like we can grow as a church locally here, but also to work and to labor to increase and spread the universal church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so, and I hope, um, you know, I, I've shared this with you guys here and there, maybe individually in this context or that context, but uh, I think this is going to be the first time I just lay it all out here for us so that you know what we're collectively working towards, okay? At least uh, there will be more clarity with regards to that. You know, by the grace of God, the Lord has been growing the church. Uh, some of you guys here got saved at Cross Life. How many of you guys by raise of hands got saved at Cross Life? By raise of hands, okay? There's a number of you got saved here at Cross Life, and then um, I know a good number of you guys have moved here from another faithful church and found your home here at Cross Life. And so God's been growing our ministry. God's been growing our church. It's an amazing thing uh, to see. Um, one of the things I'm really grateful to God about is that he has given us the finances to bring Matt on board, the pastoral staff, as a huge blessing because he is able to help meet the growing needs of the church, especially in the area of counseling. As the church grows, you know that there's no problem with, um, with preaching being scaled. And I can preach to 30 people. I can preach to 300 people. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. But when it comes down to counseling, you realize it doesn't scale in that way. And I realized I needed help. I needed help to minister to you guys, and so we brought Matt on board. And he has been an absolute blessing uh, working with you guys, spending time with you, and uh, shepherding, counseling you alongside, um, alongside myself. And um, it's, it's been good partnering together with him in that way. But I also want us to be prepared to bring on more pastoral staff, to bring on more pastoral staff to ensure that we can maintain and even increase the quality of personal leadership and discipleship to you. That's my hope. You know, several weeks ago, I had lunch with, uh, um, I had lunch with Vinny at uh, California Fish Grill. And so, um, and the reason why we got together, me and Vinny, we got together is because I was talking to him in the foyer, and we were just chatting a little bit. And I realized, man, I haven't really talked with this guy for like four years. Like four years. I go, dude, we got we to get together. And get your apartment. Let's, uh, let's, let's have lunch together. None of their apartments can make time for me. So it was just me and Vinny, okay? So me and Vinny. Yeah, Mikey was too busy for me. But me, <laughs> me and Vinny, me and Vinny, we got together. Uh, and it was good. It was good catching up. Um, but as I was thinking about it, I was kind of bummed at the fact that I can't be involved in engaging your guys' life in the way that I used to be. Uh, I remember I used to spend a lot more time with all of you individually. But it's just gotten harder a part of it is because the church has been growing. Another part of it is because uh, there's been growing needs within my own family. And so uh, I just can't give the kind of time that I did when I was single. And so, you know, although the church is growing, there are definitely growing pains. And what I realize is that I want to make sure that even as the church grows and I can't personally connect with you guys like I used to, I want to make sure that there are enough pastors and pastoral staff here in order to meet your personal needs and to be there for you, even though it might not be me personally connecting with you, that there's somebody on the leadership team who can. And my, my desire is that you are ministered to personally and meaningfully. Okay? And that's something for which I want us to prepare for uh, as the church continues to grow. But not only do I want to increase our leadership team to maintain what is needed or to help out with the shepherding needs as it grows, but also want to be proactive in growing the church, not just kind of having this defensive posture where we're preparing as the church grows, we, we bring on someone and being more reactive and making sure people are taken care of. I want to be proactive and get the gospel out um, aggressively. And I have a tendency to jump ahead of myself and make unrealistic plans, but I like to call myself a visionary. <laughs> so uh, um, my hope is that if we, can ever, if we ever get a chance to add on more pastoral staff, we can get a guy who can uh, who is competent and able in evangelism and discipleship so that he can increase our evangelistic efforts. And I have my eyes set on the different campuses around us. Uh, we've had students who have come here from Cal State Fullerton. I think we have, uh, uh, yeah, Aaron Payne, Aaron Payne and uh, 
Lucci, yes. So uh, they, Cal State Fullerton, not, not too many, but few, okay? And then we've also had a handful of students come from Cal State Long Beach. Um, and there's even Concordia University right next to UCI. So I see a great untapped opportunity for, our, for us to go there and to get the gospel out and start up some student ministry. And the reason why this form of outreach makes sense is because one of the main strengths of Cross Life is campus ministry. And many of you have come into Cross Life through our college ministry. So we know how to minister to the next generation, knowledge and experience that is not necessarily common. We must therefore be good stewards of what God has given to us. We have to remember that the younger believers will be the one who carry on the mantle as we get older. So we've got to be faithful in raising up the next generation. Well, again, personally, I don't. Man, I would love just to be on the ground, on campus, evangelizing, connecting with students, and starting up a ministry, a brand new ministry. I kind of, uh, getting back to the roots of you know, how our church started, I would love to do something like that. And to do it at multiple campuses and just start growing the gospel influence there at a time when people are um, uh, open to more discussions about faith and uh, um, to discuss things with regards to their worldview. But now, as you guys know, my time is becoming more limited. And so I would love to bring on someone on board, uh, God willing, in the future who is faithful in, evangelistic, in evangelism and would be able to blaze a trail, uh, blaze a path uh, of outreach and personally lead some of you guys um, uh, in those efforts. That's one of, one of my hopes for our church. Now, in relationship to that, one of the things I want to do is to raise up the next generation of pastoral leaders. For a long time, you know, I was kind of like the little brother among my pastoral friends. I was the, I was the kid in the group. But uh, God in his grace has sustained me over the years in the work of the ministry so that uh, I've grown older as a pastor and gained more experience in ministry so that it makes sense in my stage of life to now invest into men who might aspire to become a pastor. Uh, men I hope would even rise up from among you guys. I think that would be fantastic. And, um, and men who will rise up from among you and then uh, we can even commission into the work of the ministry like we've done with our brother Matt. But in addition to the work that we're doing here at Crossfire, we've come alongside other churches and church plants so that, we might, so that they might be well supplied in their efforts to spread the gospel. We've been supporting Pastor Ian Kwan and Emmaus Community Church who have been getting the gospel out in the Los Angeles area and recently, they recently moved to North Orange County. We're also preparing to support Pastor Chris G who recently launched a church plant uh, in the Bay Area, City Light Bible Church. And these are men whose character I can personally vouch for and who have come and ministered to our church. In addition to supporting local church churches, we have also strategically partnered with different parachurch ministries in Southern California to reach dem different demographical groups. This is very strategic on our part, okay? It's not just random support that we're throwing out. Each local church should, to a degree, reflect the city where they are ministering. And I would say generally our congregation reflects Irvine, okay? Uh, it's like culturally and socioeconomically. Now, although I hope that Cross Life can become a home for people from all different backgrounds, I understand that our evangelistic strength is in the academic and professional world in the city of Irvine and Orange County. So we, as, uh, so we partner with groups that are effective in reaching communities to which we may have difficulty reaching. One of the first groups we partnered with is Living Well Pregnancy Center. They offer free services, including ultrasounds to pregnant women. They try to share the gospel with these ladies so that they don't get any kind of governmental support. And if any of these women are considering an abortion, they counsel them and try to encourage them to keep the child, telling them that they can do it, that they can overcome the difficulties that they, they, they fear. Then there's Foster the City, which is a ministry that helps churches get connected with the world of fostering. I felt like this was a natural, uh, natural step from our stance on protecting the life of the innocent, the unborn. And then there's Los Angeles Bible Training School, which offers affordable biblical education to train believers who are then better equipped to reach the urban neighborhoods of Los Angeles. And then there's Orange County Rescue Mission, who work with the homeless to help them get back on their feet by providing housing, giving them practical uh, job training skills, and they give free legal and medical services through Christian volunteers. So we connect with these groups because they can effectively do what we cannot in the same way that we can effectively do things that they cannot. And I think of it like the way that the Apostle Peter ministered to the Jews and the Apostle Paul ministered predominantly to the Gentiles. There are different ministries with different strengths within, different, within the diverse body of Christ to fulfill the one and the same goal of making disciples of all the nations. And so we want to work together to mutually support the effort of fulfilling the Great Commission. 
Lastly, our church is committed to overseas missions. We've supported a number of missionaries in the past, John Buck in India, Gus Padal in Spain, Rafael Sabtali in Italy. And we're currently preparing to support Rachel Ko in her work in New Delhi, India. And as you know, annually we send a team out with Berean Community Church to the southern part of India to support and train local pastors there. And we know and the work that these men are doing is incredible because what they're doing is getting the gospel to unreached people groups, to unreached villages. They're doing frontier ministry, and even though they're met with physical persecution, some of them are even stoned, stoned others, a handful of them, um, were almost killed for the faith, and that God preserved them and kept them. And they're still faithfully going out, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, and people are coming to salvation. And what we do in partnership with Berean Community Church is we provide small medical aid and optometric help to the village members so that the pastors might be able to build a stronger rapport with the people there that they might be able to get the gospel out. It's an incredible opportunity that we have as a church. My hope next year is to check out more countries and to build relationships with local ministries so that um, I can provide you with more opportunities for global evangelism, for global missions. You know, my, my vision um, is that eventually we can establish a number of contacts across the world and give you a chance to experience short-term missions um, so that you would develop a heart for the loss all across the world. I think it would be, incre- it would be awesome. You have multiple places in every summer, and I know for a lot of you college students, you have uh, summer breaks, that we set up separate teams and we just send them out when they come back and share what God has done and how their perspective and views have been challenged and changed. That that passion for evangelism will continue here at Cross Life as you continue to reach the lost in Irvine and in Orange County. So that's one of my desires and something um, uh, that I hope we can establish within the church. I also want to see if there's opportunities for our pastoral staff to train local leaders. And lastly, I even want to set up something where our families, including our children, can get involved in missions. I do have some plans and ideas uh, of moving forward with all of this. And you know, my hope is that you guys would actually pray for me. Pray for me that God will give me the wisdom to get these ministries started for, for us as a church. So the goal for our church, the purpose of finances, is to practically obey the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to take, um, take an adapt analogy that, uh, from Diana that I thought was pretty helpful. Um, so I'm totally going to steal your analogy, Diana. I don't know where you're sitting, but uh, this, was, this is good. Um, you know, in our lives, there are different stories being made and told. Um, and, I like, and it's like a movie in a Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, you think about it. It's like you have your own story, your life and your story. Um, each is a standalone story. So, so for many of you, there's the adventure through college. Right? You got that adventure through college. It's exciting. Then there's the drama of relationship. There's joy, and then there's tears, there's heartbreak, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. There's the drama of relationship. Then there's the feel-good story of marriage and children with its expected challenges. And, of course, there's the extended series of work and career, a series that continues until you Retire and die. <laughs> so it's a long series. Um, and so it's easy to become focused and honed in on the mini arcs of our lives, and we fail to see the true end game, right, the end game, where each of our stories are part of a metaverse, okay? a greater story and plot that encompasses not only the significant stories of our lives, but incorporates the lives of others, and that is the epic tale of redemption. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10, it says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, and all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. The great story to which we belong is a story of redemption. The salvation of the elect, the plan established even before the foundation of the world. It's a story about the fall of man, And the hope of redemption, a tragedy of suffering and rejection, a drama of betrayal and abandonment, a horror of demons, suffering, torture, and murder, a tale of triumph and resurrection. Beloved, we are brought into this story 
that we might bring an audience to look upon the glory of God, an audience from the nations of the world to set their gaze upon the stage of Calvary, that they might see the glory of production from God himself. And that is the display and the spectacle of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the atonement of sins and the sacrifice of love, and from the tomb, the resurrection from the grave, and the conquest of death. And those who see by faith the glory of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they will be washed of their sins and delivered from the eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. They're going to be saved from hell if they look upon the glory of Jesus Christ. And by the very power of the resurrection from the dead, they too will be resurrected from the dead to forever commune with the God who has saved their souls. See, this is the grand plot of human history, a story of man's salvation and cosmic recreation, a story much larger than the arc of college or the arc of career. It is the meta-narrative of redemption. And the purpose of every single believer, even the church as a whole, is to turn the next page of the story by making disciples of all nations, bringing the gospel to one soul after another, and we have to persevere until the end, until the end, the last chapter, the final chapter of the new heavens and the new earth, the restoration of humanity, and the perfect communion with God. Church, this is what our finances are about. This is the cause to which we give, and this is the cause for which we labor. This is the cause for which we pray. When we give our offering to the Lord, we're personally worshiping God. We are coming before him and saying, God, you are worthy of everything that I have, even my life. You are worthy of my life. But when we give, we are also making our contribution in a collective effort as a church to fulfill the great commission, to make disciples of all the nations, that those who are lost might hear about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and might understand and come to know the glory of God and the newness of life that is in the death and resurrection of Christ. The story that you all personally live is without a doubt precious and valuable. But do not become so entrenched in it that you forget and lose sight of the meta narrative, the story of redemption, the story that God is using, for which God is using your life, the story that extends even before, beyond our life on earth. This is the story of redemption, and we must be faithful in forsaking the kingdom of God. Church, don't get lost with what's directly in front of you, as important as it might be. Set your eyes on eternity's future. Have that perspective and labor and give and pray accordingly. May God magnify and glorify himself through us. And may God, through our prayer, through our giving, through our sacrifice and our services, bring the lost to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is what we have been called to do. This is what we must faithfully fulfill. This is for which we must persevere. And we keep doing it, and we do it until the day that we die and we go home. That's the purpose of our life. And it's a joy that I can do it together with all of you, uh, my friends, my brothers and sisters. So let's run hard and persevere hard for our Savior. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace, the grace that saved us. And we know that the reason why we have come to know you as Lord and Savior is because there was another believer who has faithfully fulfilled the Great Commission in telling us about what you have done. And I pray that we will be faithful in taking the baton and passing it forward, getting the gospel out, training up the next generation, winning those who are lost in their sins. Help us to be strategic in the effort as well. And Lord, I pray that our faithfulness will not only be in our labor, in our service, but also in our giving. Help us to understand that as we give, we are acknowledging your worthiness, that you are greater than anything that we have and that all that we have comes from you. And may we also know that in our giving, we are making a collective effort as a church to fulfill the great commission, the commission that you have given to us. Lord, help us to be faithful. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.